So in the 19th century, it was really still used worldwide for a variety of conditions um, until, you know, aspirin was invented and then it sort of, that sort of started the, the pharmaceutical um, industry and uh, creating multiple products to treat multiple different diseases. Um, there was a gentleman named uh, William Brooke O'Saughnessy uh, back in the 19, 1830s. Uh, he had used um, cannabis or marijuana. Uh, for medical purposes for a variety of different conditions including things like muscle spasms and painful conditions He also was using it for something called melancholia uh, Which we now know as depression migraines anti-nausea anti-convulsant reasons and as a sleep aid So you're probably wondering okay, what happened? Where, where was the disconnect? Um, how did suddenly you know the whole world knew for thousands of years that this is a plant that's very useful uh, in our society how did it all go away? Well, back in uh, 1939, marijuana as a whole was banned in the United States under a federal law. And uh, this was called the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act. <clears throat> now, do you all know how or why? It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty nasty, actually. It, was, it had nothing to do with science, it had nothing to do with medicine. It was, it was per portrayed that marijuana was uh, something that people of color used, and uh, it was really associated with a lot of racist connotations, a lot of, they say it was kind of a low-class thing to do. And, um, and then so obviously that got perpetuated, and they said, you know what, we should ban this because we don't want these, these, these you know, horrible people you know, using these horrible drugs. So it was kind of, it, it was really misrepresented as a, uh, a drug that people of color would use. And uh, so it was obviously then banned as a reason. So really it was not science, it was racism that caused uh, uh, medical cannabis to, or I'm sorry, marijuana uh, to be banned. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't deaths, it wasn't science, it was idiots <laughs> um, using uh, really uh, uh, some nasty thought. Now thank you for that applause. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, in 1972, uh, it was brought to light that, uh, again, you know, in the Western world, actually in the Western world, it was uh, really brought to light that, hey, uh, marijuana might have some benefits uh, in 1972 for glaucoma patients, but really it started to be known uh, even as far back as uh, the 60s and 70s when um, a, a PhD out of Israel started exploring marijuana uh, for its illicit purposes, really doing research and wondering why, you know, why are people, uh, well, you know, uh, why do they get high, you know, what's going on? And he was actually the one who started discovering THC, started discovering that there were actually compounds, CBD compounds and derivatives of CBD that started helping with pain and started helping with, you know, seizures and starting helping with a lot of these conditions that they've already known about, but now there was actually science they could extrapolate these compounds. They could extract these compounds. And there was science behind why this helped. And that's what we need, right? And even now, that's what we need. We, don't, we need science to overturn a lot of the, you know, the, really what's gone on for almost 100 years, this perception that, that uh, it's such an evil drug that, that kills millions and millions of people. Um, back in the 1990s, um, a drug became relatively popular um, called Marinol. It really was uh, started in the 1970s, started becoming, you know, gaining traction in the 90s and even the 2000s um, as a synthetic THC that could help with pain. Uh, I, we prescribed it a few times when we really ran out of options, but um, never really found that it helped much. Uh, definitely didn't help as much as, uh, you know, patients who would come to our office and they would say, really privately, obviously, and, and just really until just a couple of years ago, I, it was really undercovers that they would say, you know what, I have to admit something. I, I smoked marijuana because I didn't know what else to do. And then so, you know, you sort of ask them, okay, what happened when you smoked that? Like, what, how'd you feel? You know, they're like, it took away my pain. Um, so then we'd say, well, you know, I can't advocate that you do this. And, and quite frankly, until even just a couple of years ago, we would have to be compelled to be forced to kick them out of our practice because that's what the laws stated. We could not, um, well, that's if we prescribed something, we prescribed any type of medication to them and they had marijuana in their system, we had to act on that. Either we had to cut them off of all their medications or, or kick them out of the practice. Um, so, so in some of those cases, we said, okay, if you stop using marijuana and I prescribe this Marinol, you know, maybe that would be okay. Um, so we tried that and it just, it failed in many situations. And the reason it failed is because medical cannabis is incredibly complicated. 
it's not just THC, it's not just CBD, it's not just you know a plant, it's, it's, it's so much more. You have to have the right combination of a lot of different compounds to actually have an effect, and every single person is different. And that's why the synthetic cannabis really, uh, the synthetic THC really didn't and hasn't done the same things that, the, that medical cannabis has. So um, now circling back, back into the 1970s and 80s, uh, you had health departments in six states that were, started studying uh, medical cannabis um, usage. And then back in, from 1996 to 2013, we've seen multiple states adopt medical cannabis programs. Uh, 96 was really the first, you know, you saw that uh, occurring initially in, in California. And then the National Institute of Mental Health and the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Strokes uh, completed research on several medical uses of cannabis in the early 2000s. In 2003, the United States Department of Health and Human Services was awarded a patent entitled Cannabinoids as Antioxidants and Neuroprotectants. So we've seen in the endocannabinoid system, uh, it actually it can act as a neuroprotective system. So when we see a, a, an imbalance in the endocannabinoid system, we see an imbalance in neuroprotective mechanisms. In some cases, um, we actually see an overstimulation of the endocannabinoid system, potentially causing neurodegenerative changes. An underdeveloped uh, or underactive neurocannabinoid system, again, may see neural degradation and lack of maintenance. So it has to be just right. Um, they made a claim that it's useful in the treatment and the prophylaxis of oxidation-associated diseases such as ischemic, age-related inflammatory diseases and autoimmune diseases. The cannabinoids that they, they were looking at um, were neuroprotective in limiting certain diseases uh, that really uh, we don't have any great answers for, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and HIV dementia.